Welcome to Inside the Walls with William Pasquale, brought to you by Perner Frederick Commercial Real Estate. Welcome to a new level of commercial real estate built upon relationships and proven results. Good afternoon and welcome to Inside the Walls with William Pasquale. Today we'll be speaking with Jerry Sweeney, Chief Executive Officer of Brandywine Realty Trust, a New York Stock Exchange traded company. Jerry has overseen the growth of Brandywine from four properties with a total market capitalization of less than $5 million to over 28 million square feet and a total market capitalization of approximately 5 billion. A pillar of the greater Delaware Valley, Jerry is also the chairman of the Schuylkill River Development Corporation, chairman of the Center City District Foundation, and chairman for the Philadelphia Regional Port Authority. And here's a sneak peek into what Brandywine Real Estate Trust is all about. We are fueled by a passion for quality, integrity, innovation, and community. A commitment to thinking big, diving deep, and delivering results. We are partners, neighbors, trailblazers. Owning, leasing, developing, and managing hundreds of properties and millions of square feet nationwide. We are always looking toward the future. We know the value in what we do lies in the difference we can make. We are Brandywine Realty Trust. And welcome, Jerry Sweeney. William, great to see you. How are you today? I'm doing incredible. Thank you very much. And I really do, we do really appreciate you coming onto the show so we could learn a little bit more about Brandywine and all the exciting things that have been happening recently. And since this is your, you know, since this interview is being really shown on a global scale, I mean, I obviously know who you are and a lot of people in Philadelphia know. Uh, not everybody's familiar with who you are. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and Brandywine Realty Trust. Yeah, that's great. William, look, we're del I'm delighted to be here and uh, always appreciate a chance to uh, share the Brandywine story. It's, it's a company that we started about 25 years ago. Uh, again, as you outlined, it was a really small asset base. And we really grew the company uh, with a, a focus of being a major player in just several markets around the country. So we're right now the uh, largest landlord in the Philadelphia region. Uh, in Austin, Texas, and a large platform in Washington, D.C. So really a three-market company. We, uh, we really built the company on four pillars, quality, uh, integrity, innovation, and community. So we wanted to take a different approach to real estate development. Uh, so we've actively engaged with the community over the years. Uh, company has been uh, vertically integrated. We do everything from buying large tracts of land, going through the approval process, right. doing spot developments, uh, everything from managing, leasing, uh, providing engineering and development services to our client base. So it's uh, unfortunate to, to lead a team of really talented and exciting people. As you picked up in that video, we really believe in our core mission and wake up every day excited to, to accomplish it. That's a, and, that's, and that's what I know Brandywine as. How did you like? You have a very you know interest. You have a very interesting background. How did you end up being where you are at Brandywine and doing what you're doing with them? Yeah, I mean, I, my my original background is I'm an accountant. I'm an old CPA by trade, uh, and I wound up working for a private real estate development company, where I wound up being a partner there after a number of years and was there about uh, 12 years, and then really spun those four assets out of that private development company to start Brandywine back in 1994. And really along the way, I, I very quickly realized that, you know, where the, where the assets themselves are important, the most important thing is how you approach it and the people that run those assets. So we've kind of built a really good team over the years. Uh, and that's really been one of, I think, the secrets to our success. Now, since the pandemic began, Brandywine has been really out in front. So you're really out in front supporting your tenants. And as the CEO of a major REIT, you have multiple interests that you're serving, your shareholders lenders, and most importantly, your employees at Brandywine. How have you been able to, as a leader, manage all these critical stakeholders that make Brandywine, Brandywine effectively? Like, what have you drawn from in your past to lead in this time? 
Yeah, look, I mean, the, the real estate business is very cyclical by nature. So you can't have been in a long time without being buffeted by a number of storms. That, be, that being said, I'm not sure anything prepared anybody for going through this pandemic. Uh, so we, uh, we approached it aggressively from the very beginning. Uh, and we really approached it recognizing we were in a crisis. And that crisis had both presented some significant danger for us, but also some opportunity. And I think, uh, you know, we wound up uh, focusing from the danger side first to make sure we had that covered. So the safety of our employees, of all the em employers that have tenant or have their employees in our buildings, safety and security was a number one concern. So we had a, an internal task force, which we called the COVID-19 task force, was a, was a cross-disciplinary team of functional executives that focused on how we make our buildings safe and accessible for those folks that need it. Uh, we then keyed in very quickly on making sure our financial platform was solid, which it really is. Uh, engage with political policymakers, community groups to make sure we're communicating well with them. And then making sure that we took a look at what our forward capital spend was. Uh, but I think the theme we really focused on that anytime you're in a crisis, uh, people are nervous. There's a high level of anxiety, whether that's an employer yeah. or an individual person. Yeah. So what we really wound up doing is going to a very aggressive uh, communication campaign. So we have, as you mentioned, we have a lot of stakeholders, uh, public shareholders, public bondholders. So we instituted a whole level of communication, uh, 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 systemic outreach, where I give an example, I held employee calls every week uh, to make sure that all of our employees knew exactly what was going on, how we were approaching the danger side of the equation, how we were keeping our eye out for the opportunity side. Uh, I had weekly board meetings to make sure that my board members were very much apprised of what's going on. Our CFO and some of our finance team and myself had an extensive outreach to our shareholder base. And we dramatically increased our disclosure around the things we were doing to ensure that our portfolio, our tenant and our revenue base uh, were kept in sync. Uh, and then we did a number of other things relative to making sure that we reached out to community groups to make sure they understood that we were there for them. Uh, we launched a uh, COVID-19 fund with a nonprofit where we funded $350,000 to provide uh, interim financing to uh, small emerging minority owned businesses to make sure they had the capital wherewithal to get through the crisis. And we've really maintained in our buildings a, uh, uh, you know, a doors open lights on approach because a number of our tenants are essential businesses. Yeah. And they, need, they need to get into our, in, into our buildings. Uh, I guess the only parallel I can give you is having gone through the great financial crisis where it was just a terrible time again for everybody. Uh, you know, you really need to pivot to make sure that you're, uh, you're focused forward. And I remember during the great financial crisis, uh, you know, as bad as things were and as bleak as they were for office in this business, I, I would get up every morning and make sure I came into work whistling, saying hello, being as sunny in my disposition as you could be, even Absolutely. though things weren't great. Because people take a cue. And I think uh, our entire leadership team did the entire did the same thing during COVID-19 to really make sure that we allayed whatever concerns any of our employees might have. And we kept everybody on payroll. We reached out to our primary service vendors, our janitorial companies, security companies, construction companies, to make sure that they had continuity of employment, to make sure that they were comfortable as well. Uh, so I think that the bottom line is when you're in that kind of situation, you really need to make sure you think about every potential avenue where you can communicate, give comfort, give assurances, and land a clear path forward. And that's what we tried to do during this whole process. Wonderful. You know, I, you know, it, it's important to bring strong leadership in a time like this. And I, you know, I, what resonates with me is that sometimes you just have to put a smile on the face and really just present yourself. You know, I mean, it's like. I don't want to say it could always be worse, yeah. but, you know, we're here and we're here to lead. And, you know, so coming in with a smile on your face, I think that's an incredible takeaway for any leader just to, you know, to stay positive throughout the crisis because everybody's yeah, watching. You, you, you do, you need, because people do pick up their cue from their, from the people who they, they view are in leadership roles. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt had a great quote that, you know, great leaders are made great through great people. 
And I think mm. you really can't make you can't really make people great and really uh, uh, buy into the programs you're trying to sell or your core mission without them recognizing that there's good leadership in place. And and again, we've got a great leadership team at both the corporate office and all of our regional offices. And I think we all marched in lockstep to convey that sense of confidence, control, and uh, and good communication throughout the whole ordeal. Wonderful. Now, every day we're all hearing about different opinions out in the workplace about, you know, about this pandemic and, you know, the resulting effect in the workplace. You've got work from, you're hearing about work from home, back to the office and the impact of the physical works, you know, the workspace. Like within the last decade, we've gone from office space with many private, you know, private offices to a very open landscape. You know, do you, I mean, being one of the largest landlords, you know, out there, you know, do you see us going back to private offices and maybe ask a different way? It's December 31st, 2021, 11.59 p.m. You know, we've all got our glasses of wine or champagne ready to go. Presume that we have a, you know, vaccine for COVID, good therapeutics. Are we actually having a Mummer's Day here, parade here in Philadelphia? And what is the future of the works, you know, the workplace look like post pandemic has anything yeah. really shifted yeah look there a lot there's a lot packed into that question so let yeah. me uh, let me try and address it uh, at different levels you know one i think the way we approached it is that look technology had already been accelerating the rate of change in the office business and i think the pandemic just accentuated that rate of acceleration uh, so there's no question, and we've been talking about this as a leadership team for years, you know, I, I head up an office company. The reality is the mobility and the optionality that technology affords me means I don't necessarily need an office. So we, we very, a number of years ago, really shifted our focus to not just the office being a physical space, but being a place that can help define corporate culture, uh, help define a company's brand, help improve their productivity, their profitability, their attraction and retention techniques for employees. So we tend to take a very holistic view of the office business where really the office space itself is really kind of a work in process. It's not a finished yeah. product. And I think what we've seen uh, during this pandemic with so many folks migrating from work to, to, to working from home is, and I've talked to a lot of our, our major tenants uh, as our leadership team has as well. And I think anyone would admit that what we've been doing as, a, as, a, as an economy, uh, and certainly from an office standpoint, we've been doing business triage for the last six months. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, we've been maintaining levels of productivity that are certainly below what could be effectively achieved in uh, in, 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 a, in a poor workplace environment. Uh, the uh, uh, we're hearing from our tenants that they really can't wait to get back to the office, and I think we're working closely with them to make sure there's a very good uh, transition plan in place. Uh, so you know, if you if you kind of expand how you view the office, it's not just a place to sit at a desk or in an office, it's really a space to grow, to focus, to connect, to celebrate, uh, to commiserate when something goes wrong in your business, to uh, collaborate, create uh, sources of inspiration. And I think that's what a lot, we're hearing from a lot of our tenants that they're, what they're really missing. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're getting the checks paid, they're receiving rents, they're uh, managing projects on a triage, as I mentioned, type of basis. But the, the energy level, the enthusiasm that drives businesses forward is hard to do in a format like you and I are talking today. Yeah, Zoom, so, is not the, Zoom is not everything, that's for sure. It, no, exactly. And, and look, I, I had the benefit of being on a, uh, a Zoom call yeah. uh, about kind of the, the future of urban space a number of months ago. And on that was a, was a, was a, a doctor who specialized in, in pandemics. And one of the things they said that really hit me was that, you know, when you track pandemics over the, 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 the history of the human race, one of the things that really proves out is the res resiliency of the human spirit. You know, people can adapt, people can respond. The human spirit requires connection points. And I think we all, whether we're working from home or working in the office or uh, not going out to restaurants, we're all feeling that sense of isolation. 
So to, to wrap up where you with your your last point was, I actually do think that we are on a clear linear path towards a, a, a world where we are back doing mummers parades, where we are back attending Eagles games, wherever your favorite football team is. You're going out to restaurants. I think, you know, people are recognizing the need for personal responsibility and accountability and how that transcends into group collective behavior. And I think uh, uh, we're on that path with if a vaccine comes down the, path, the road, that I think will be very helpful. I, I think a survey done by the Center City District in Philadelphia indicated that about 90% of the people they surveyed were waiting for a vaccine before they really felt comfortable coming back to work. You know, and another key issue is mass transportation. You know, how we handle uh, m the mobility of moving people from the suburbs to the city, vice versa, and within the city itself. And I think uh, we'll shortly see here in the Philadelphia region, the, uh, the Regional Rail Authority, SEPTA, start to embark on a pretty aggressive outreach program to indicate how safe it is to ride, up, uh, to ride public transportation. So I think what the pandemic really did was accelerate some of the underlying trends that were in place already relative to technology formation and, uh, uh, and workforce flexibility. Uh, and we'll see how it plays out. I think, uh, you know, we're seeing it, we're providing as part of our, our return from, uh, from home program, you know, free space planning services for a lot of our tenants who may want to think about how they move from a bench or a workstation format into uh, more, uh, more of a, a traditional office environment. And we'll see how that trend line where tenants want to have more distance within an office, right? how that trend line compares to a percentage of the workforce that will have optionality to work from home on a regular basis. So uh, we have not seen any real fraying of, of, uh, of demand drivers. We see everything in abeyance right now, but uh, we still have uh, high hopes for a strong recovery in the office business. Absolutely. And uh, interesting you mentioned about the public transportation and the regional rail. I mean, uh, you know, I live out in suburban Philadelphia as well. And so, you know, every once in a while I am taking the train into the city and, uh, you know, I get on an Exton station and normally the Great Valley Flyer had, you know, pre-COVID would have like a hundred people getting on that train at least. Mm -hmm. Maybe five people now. 10. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, it, it, I mean, you know, I mean, and somebody from my office the other day, cause you know, you know, from our office, you know, said there was five people getting on in Paoli and I'm sitting here going, is it, is it literal fear that's just making people not getting on the train system? Because it sure as heck isn't the actual reality because, you know, not to do a plug for SEPTA, but they've actually done a really good job of spacing it out and making sure everybody is okay. And people are wearing masks. So it's like, you know, what's it, I'm trying to, what is, is it really, we're all waiting just for the vaccine to come along before everybody feels safe enough to come back into the office? Is it, you know, the rules from, you know, from the, you know, from the Wolf administration, you know, that that's, you know, you know, and state laws, like, you know, what do you think it's really going to be that's going to get people to come back into the city and into yeah, the offices and the burbs? Yeah, we, we've done a number of surveys. Our team's done a great outreach program, both uh, from our leasing and property teams. And, uh, you know, we're also very large. I think we're the third or fourth largest owner of parking in the city of Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, one of the major requests we had from tenants, the thing about coming back was, could we provide short-term parking? Uh, hmm. I, I think there's, there's a number of philosophically gating issues uh, that we're all dealing with. You know, one is there, as you touched on, I mean, there is a fair degree of dissonance in public policy. Uh, I think there's differences between what the city of Philadelphia is saying, what the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is saying, the state of Delaware, New Jersey. So I think as, it, while all that noise is out there, people aren't really sure what to do. Uh, I think uh, employers, large employers in particular, are concerned about bringing people back to work too soon because that could create liability issues for them while this, while legislation is still pending on how to handle employer liability. Uh, we still have a number of folks who, uh, uh, you know, have school age children and the schools aren't quite back. Some are back, some are not back, some are back part time, some won't come back till later. Uh, and then you have the whole issue that we just talked about with mass transportation. So there's a number of competing uh, 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 in influences, I think, are, are present, presenting a bit of a gate to the timing of when people come back. Uh, I do think we've seen a big uptick in our buildings just since Labor Day. Uh, and with some, of the re, with some of the relaxation of some of the rules in Philadelphia. Uh, 
So, so that's why I feel confident we're back. We're back on a linear path. I'm not sure what the I'm not sure what the angle of that line is. Right. Uh, but I think I think I think people really are beginning to evaluate that the 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 cost to them of remaining somewhat isolated from a personal or from a business standpoint uh, uh, is uh, is not worth uh, you know coming back in. I mean, there's this need to come back in and kind of collaborate, get back in touch with people. And I think you're going to see that happen more and more, particularly as events progress over the next few weeks. Now, I also understand that, you know, from the recent uh, you know announcements in the Philadelphia Business Journal and in your uh, in your, you know, your financial reports that you're moving ahead with the development of the two new towers at Schuylkill Yards Project, you know, with Drexel University, despite some of this uncertainty in the market. Tell us about this project and what it'll mean for the University City section of Philadelphia. Yeah, look, we're very excited. Look, and, and, and frankly, Brandywine has two major neighborhoods in the process of being created. One is Schuylkill Yards in Philadelphia, but then we also have a, a development underway that's uh, actually slightly larger than Schuylkill Yards called our Broadmoor Development in Austin, Texas. And we think both are tremendous opportunities to kind of differentiate how you create a neighborhood. So, hmm. you know, in Austin, for example, our Broadmoor development will be Austin's first transit-oriented development. Austin has an emerging mass transit system. We're at the vanguard of working with their regional rail authority to create a public-private partnership to create rail access to our site. But in Schuylkill Yards, I, I think it's it, it's it, it's an amazing time uh, for us because we have moved through all the planning processes. Schuylkill Yards, by framing it as about a five million square foot mixed-use development. Where we see a tremendous opportunity for both Brandywine, University City, and frankly, for the city of Philadelphia, is with the scale of what we plan on doing, we can help rebrand Philadelphia as a life science ecosystem. We have uh, we have pivoted our master plan significantly at Schuylkill Yards to focus on uh, more than 2 million square feet of life science space. Uh, so as we envision Schuylkill Yards, it'll be a, a heavy concentration of life science uh, uh, a traditional office and uh, and multifamily residential for rent. So we really feel like we have an ability to create a real neighborhood that adjoins the third busiest train station in the country, uh, as well as uh, University of Pennsylvania, their health system, children's hospital, as well as Drexel University. So we really think that if you think about it thematically, you know, Philadelphia originally was formed on the banks of the Delaware River. Yep. Uh, it migrated in the uh, in the 1700s, early 1800s, to to, uh, 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 to Old City around Independence Hall. Migrated to uh, City Hall today around uh, where Broad and Market are. We really do view that there's an opportunity to migrate the center of gravity of the entire city of Philadelphia to the University City section within the next 20 years. And we think Schuylkill Yards, given its proximity to both the, the traditional CBD. Uh, the university and healthcare systems to the west, and that uh, and that wonderful river, the Scoop River, that runs between it. Uh, we really have a, a tremendous obligation and an opportunity to kind of create a city within a city. So, we are planning on moving forward with our Scoop Yards West Tower, which would be a couple hundred thousand square feet of commercial space, of which half of that would be life science and 325 residential units. And then we have our 3151 Market Street project, which is a, uh, a fully dedicated life science project uh, that is scheduled to break ground in the second quarter of next year. So we've already done uh, 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 the, the creation of a, of a great public space called Drex Drexel Square. We completed that last year. We uh, uh, just finalized the renovation of the Bolton building, which is now wholly occupied by Spark Therapeutics, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of, of, of Roche Pharmaceuticals. And we'll have our lighting ceremony with a big scoop of yard sign and the ticker tape uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, we've had some other great activity on the life science side. We're converting uh, several floors within the existing Sierra Center building into life science to meet near term demand and be launching some incubator space there as well. So we think there's a lot of green shoots in, the, in, in our ability to create a life science ecosystem at 30th Street train station. We mm -hmm. think we can augment that by some of the infrastructure we're putting, uh, putting in place and the tremendous or the close proximity to those major institutions. So all systems are go. We certainly wanna be mindful of the environment in which we're building. 
Uh, so we're being very pragmatic in how we're assessing the risk of starting those projects. But these projects are 30 to 36 month build out. So we're forecasting a much brighter day in the economy three years from now than we're facing right now. Absolutely. One of the things I wanted to cover was real quickly is, you know, if you had to identify three things that business owners and entrepreneurs should be taking action on now as they prepare for when they could bring their employees back to the office, what would they be? Oh, three things. Um, you know, I think that the, the number one thing uh, by far, and it goes back to what we talked about initially is, I think every employer really needs to listen to their employees uh, and the local health officials and develop a plan that is detailed and very effectively communicated. I, I think any, any question left unanswered today in today's environment creates anxiety. So be prepared how you're gonna deal with the exception conditions of uh, uh, people who are taking care of elderly or high risk people, high risk employees, uh, 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 parents who are employees or parents taking care of, of young school age children who are not back at school. So uh, while we're, well, it's always important to treat every employee fairly, we are unfortunately in an environment that is full of exceptions. Yes. So how, how an employer would address those exceptions up front and communicate, that, communicate those effectively to their entire employee base, I think will be a, a, a tremendous smoothing point and a culture builder for that company uh, by implementing that kind of plan. Uh, I also think that they should have a very defined physical back to work plan in terms of uh, uh, personal protective equipment, wayfinding systems in their space how to deal with uh, uh, getting people to work. Uh, Brandywine, for example, we rolled out a very detailed back to work plan that covers every possible concern a tenant may have uh, uh, in terms of, of social distancing within elevators, how to stagger work time. So I would encourage those employers to work with their landlord to make sure that there is an effective transition. Once the employee gets to the building, that there's an effective transition and a very safe healthy operating environment within the building. And uh, I think the third thing, and and forgive me for, for putting in a plug, is I think you know, we're hearing from many, many companies that now the capital condition of their buildings are of grave concern. You know, what's mm. the state of the HVAC system? What's the state of the vertical transportation? Do, is it, do, do you have the capability for MERV or, or, MERV or HEPA quality filters? So we're actually seeing, and I think it's an encouraging sign for the office space in general, more and more companies starting to look at migrating up the quality curve for their office space. Because again, they want to provide that physical platform for their employees that's safe, secure, healthy, and accessible. And things that before may not have been at the forefront of an employer's thinking in terms of HVAC in a building or the speed of elevators is now getting to be a major factor. So we think the Brandywine portfolio is very well positioned. We have a number of development projects on the drawing boards in the suburbs as well as in the city uh, and in all of our markets. And we're actively ramping up those campaigns to make sure that we've articulated to that potential tenant base all of the post COVID-19 features that we're building into all of our new buildings and how we have modified some of our existing buildings to increase that level of comfort that a tenant may, may need to have to communicate to their employee base. So I think I see they're the kind of the three major drivers. Thank you, and really do appreciate that. I'm sure the audience and people that'll be watching this will definitely take you know take some good uh, information from that that they can utilize in their businesses and uh, appreciate that. Um, so just as we're wrapping up, I, you know, I understand that you know when I was doing my research that you're also the co-founder and co-CEO. And I hopefully I don't mess this up because I've been practicing yeah. this with people. So, with the, the Bonomo Turkish Taffy up in Great hey, Neck? You got it, yeah. Uh, you did get it right, yes. Yeah, it's good, good job. You, 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 you've had a successful <laughs> day. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's Bonomo Turkish Taffy. It was, like, it was a, 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 a small Northeast market uh, uh, candy that was made back many, many years ago in New York. And it was my favorite candy as a child. So, huh. as a, and they stopped making it. Was the uh, Bonomo Turkish Taffy was acquired by another public candy company back in the '70s. Production was discontinued uh, back in the late '70s. So, just through a whole series of happenstances, I was able to connect with the owner of that candy, 
and I bought it a number of years ago. So it's kind of a, just a, a niche nostalgic candy that we're uh, we're trying to improve the sales on. But it's uh, it's a great story because it was one of those things that came out of a discussion with my uh, uh, my brothers and sisters when we were thinking about our childhood and. We're talking about what was your favorite candy, your favorite movie, your favorite car. And uh, I used to love eating Bonomo Turkish taffy, particularly the banana kind. And I uh, just started doing some research and over a period of a year or so got involved where I was able to buy it and start the manufacturing of it along with uh, another uh, another partner. So it's been a, it's been a fun little project on the side. Certainly not the office business, but <laughs> no, no. Just, just like the office business, it brings joy to people. So that's what we like to do. <laughs> where can where can I go get some? Like where where it's can a, we purchase this? It's actually it's actually in about ten thousand outlets around the country now. So we're uh, 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 Wawa sold it for a while. The dollar store sold it. Some of the drug stores sell it. Uh, 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 Cracker Barrel sells it. So it, it's it's pretty accessible. We're actually trying to retool it from the normal uh, bar format to getting down to the smaller bars and the twist. So we're in the middle of going through that manufacturing retooling right now. I think I guarantee you that within the next 24 hours, I'm going to go find some just because I have to try it now. <laughs> well, if you can't find any, I, 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 I have an inventory. I'm happy to pass them on. <laughs> so the final thing I ask everybody that comes onto this show is wisdom on the wall. You know, people have mantras that they live by, credos that they follow you know, like a favorite quote that they have that really drives them and moves them on a day to day basis. What are some yeah. of those words that you live by? Uh, well, I'll look at it from both a, a business and a personal standpoint. Uh, okay. And they're both kind of intertwixed. But, it, 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 you know, anyone that's worked with me knows I have a picture of a turkey on my wall in the office. And underneath the picture of the turkey, it says not every real estate project turns out as expected. <laughs> and I look at that every, every time we go to make an investment decision, I'll, I always look at that. And I think what what that really does is ground me because, we, we, you know, the real estate business is one that tends to be e egocentric and emotionally driven. And I think, you know, it's very, very important to make sure that you maintain a level of humility about how you approach the business because we are dealing. Look, we're talking about scoople yards. They're, they're 36 month build. That's the world could be completely different to the positive or the negative in, in, in three years. So you're taking a lot of risks. So, I mean, one of my favorite sayings, you know, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty uh, and before honor goes humility. So I think being, having a level of humility as you approach things, and certainly I know our team has that because you really need to recognize that just because you want it to be so doesn't always make it so. And uh, everyone has to manage their ego and their own expectations in the context of a world in which we can't control everything. And I think at a personal level, and this really was replete through uh, the board meetings that uh, we did and all the employee calls, was really the four Fs, which is, you know, family, faith, focus, forward. And I think, you know, uh, nothing's more important than family. And I think we tried to build a culture that's family oriented you know, both your own family, but the Brandywine family. Uh, faith, however you define it, has to be a governing predicate of your life. I mean, you have to have some level of foundation to help you guide all the decisions you make, whether it's personal or professional. Focus, you got to focus on the task at hand, but then always want to keep your mind forward. So I think as we look at those four words, they really kind of got us through the pandemic. Uh, they help us focus on those danger items and also helped us identify forward areas where the, that can present some opportunity for us. So uh, I, guess, I guess that's how I would wrap up those comments. I mean, you know, humility and those four Fs, I think, are really, at least for me, have been very helpful in helping me uh, keep myself grounded anyway. Well, thank you again, Jerry, for joining us. So Jerry Sweeney, CEO of Brandywine Realty Trust, thank you for joining us. And for everybody that's out there, until next week, thank you for joining. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much.